spent the last lecture dealing with mythology and how the ancestors saw the stars. And we tried to pull out some value from that, um, perhaps some much needed value. And I think that there's a bit more to that story. Um, spent a lot of time thinking about that conversation afterwards and um, particularly as it relates to the world today. And so I want to bring up a couple more points about that when we get to it, because almost our entire story today takes place inside of the Orion Nebula. And Orion, as we know from last time, happens to be one of the oldest and most central points of mythology across all cultures going back tens of thousands of years. And I don't think that's entirely a coincidence, right? So we'll play with that a bit more, which I think will be fun. Um, but otherwise, we're going to just talk about the physical processes that lead to star formation. And this is a topic uh, of ongoing investigation. Um, you know, we've only begun to have the technology to really look into these distant places and examine what processes might be occurring. But the funny thing about star formation is that it takes place inside of these giant clouds that we talked about before. And if you can imagine trying to study something in a cloud here on Earth, it's not an easy task to pull off, right? Obviously, clouds interfere with light, and light is all we've got in astronomy. So there's a lot of uh, critical details, particularly in the last moments. Before, when you go from a really dense region into a star, there's quite a bit of murkiness in that story. And we have a few ideas, but I think that there's a, a big wealth of gaping holes that uh, your generation will hopefully address. Um, you know, in the last, uh, and we're going to work towards understanding planets too, because the consensus picture right now is that all of the planets form at the same time as the stars. And this is maybe on the move as well, especially as we've started to realize there's these things called brown dwarfs that uh, are something between a star and a planet. In fact, they look a lot like a Jupiter. Um, and so, and, we, and we're starting to believe that those brown dwarfs form through similar processes as stars. So that story is on the move. Um, you know, one thing that I think is really interesting your, uh, your textbook opens with this story. Um, and I, I want to read you this quote because I think it's really critical uh, for you guys to understand. Actually, if you learn anything in this class, I think the most important thing would be that there's probably, an, there's a better way to do science in the future than the way that we've done it in the past, the way that we explain nature. And we should always be working towards uh, better ways of doing what we're doing here. And uh, I think this story from your textbook illustrates this really well. So they tell the story of uh, Giordano, Giordano Bruno, um, who was uh, something of a philosopher and scientist, I guess if you could call it that. Remember, there was no such thing as a professional scientist until about 100 years ago. Uh, but Giordano Bruno wrote quite a bit. He wrote this one book called On the Infinite Universe and Worlds in 1584. And they burned him at the stake for it. Okay. And this seems rather extreme, but this sort of thing is still playing out today. And so, you know, obviously people aren't getting burned at the stake, but it's a very dangerous matter to, uh, <clears throat> it's a dangerous matter to, challenge paradigms without sufficient political grounds to do so. I don't mean political like bipartisan politics like Democrats and Republicans. I mean coalition building within science, making friends, you know, slowly working towards a new understanding by uh, through social means, actually. So anyways, this quote from your book is quite interesting. This is what uh, Giordana got uh, burned for. He wrote this. There are countless suns and countless earths all rotating around their suns in exactly the same way as the planets of our system. 
We see only the suns because they are the largest bodies and are luminous, but their planets remain invisible to us because they're smaller and non-luminous. The unnumbered worlds in the universe are similar in form and rank and subject to the same forces and the same laws as us. And you might think, wow, that seems really reasonable. Why, why on earth would anybody uh, condemn this, this worldview? And, um, you know, on one hand, it's, quite, it's, it's as simple as, well, that's not what the cosmological authority structures at the time believed. Of course, they looked up at the world for thousands of years, and they saw the earth was quite clearly a flat disk. And there's a giant series of spheres that are all revolving around it at the top, right? And to be fair, that's absolutely true. Like from a completely relativistic standpoint, if you're standing on Earth, there's, there's no falsehood to the description of reality that there is a sphere, which is the sky over your head, and it is rotating with respect to you. And so it's not so much that this new world worldview that Bruno was proposing was wrong. It was just a different way of looking at things that didn't put mankind at the center of the universe. And uh, for, this is very troubling to the, the, the state at the time, right? Because, you know, you got to think the state back then is very different than the state in our times, right? So what is our state in America here? Our state is essentially founded on the principle of individual sovereignty, right? And what's that mean? It means like you, the, the voter, the citizen, has the ability to make decisions as well as anyone else. And you're going to participate in it. Each individual has that ability to weigh the facts and come up with a decision on their own. But it wasn't that way in the past, right? In the past, there was no separation between the church and the state. So we may as well think of uh, the people who are specifying the cosmology the, the church as the rulers and their doctrine was the final say. And so the idea that somebody could come up with their own idea was completely heretical, right? And, uh, you know, in any society, in any organization of people, you're always having to contend with the tendency for power to subvert the overarching principles of that structure and lead to various forms of tyranny, right? We see this. This is what most political debates are about. They're about this push and pull between state-centered authority and tyranny, right? You're always trying to push back against that. Bruno, Giordano, I don't know why I can't say this guy's name. Gior, Giordano, I'm probably saying it wrong. Anybody Italian in, in the audience can help us with this? Giordano. Giordano. Um, so you might, you might think like this seems like a, a relatively silly thing to get worked up about, but ultimately the stories that we tell, right, they're, they're extremely important. And this is actually playing out in our modern world much more centrally than you might realize. And I think it's going to become increasingly clear when we move into the cosmological discussion, because the cosmology that we've embraced since antiquity is essentially a cosmology that reflects our own experiences on Earth, right? So, and really not just your experience in terms of, okay, yeah, we're all born and we're all going to die. So that's an important piece of our cosmology. And of course, we reflect that when we look up at the sky and we tell these stories, right? I mean, the title, I don't know the title of this chapter in your book that we're doing this week, but it's something like the birth of stars or something, right? The, the, the inability for us to even come up with a word that accounts for what's happening to these bodies that isn't biological is astounding, right? We don't have any way of conceptualizing things like this, these processes, other than life and death. And the whole cosmos is essentially treated that way. And it's always been treated that way. And there's something really valuable to that, too. I, I, I'm not trying to kick this machine. There's something really valuable about looking at even every day, right? When that sun hits your eyes in the morning, it's almost like you're having this rebirth experience, right? Um, you know, the, 
the beginning of a movie when the lights come up or a play or something, right? There's this sense of the start and the end as the sun goes down. Actually, all of our poetic metaphors for death concern sunsets and, you know, the dusk and the, the you know, these are, these are very valuable ways of looking at things. And I think it's really important because in some sense, your day, every day of your life is like a mini version of your entire life. You, you have this feeling, hopefully, when you wake up in the morning that uh, I should probably get some stuff done today. I should probably move myself towards some eventuality that's better than where I'm at yesterday. And the whole life actually should be like that, right? When you're sitting on your deathbed, what do you want to feel at the end, right? I mean, do you want to look back and be like, yeah, that was really comfortable and easy? Probably not. Like, you want to look back and be like, well, uh, that was a hell of an exploration. That was quite an adventure, right? You want to feel like you progressed through something, and each day is kind of like that. And so, of course, our cosmology, our ability to order the chaos, our ability to put a narrative on top of it, also should reflect some progression from chaos into order. And so, if you look at our standard cosmology, which is called essentially Big Bang cosmology, it is a story of this complete wild hot sea of foam that's exploding and forming all of this complexity and life and planets and stars and all of these ordered structures, right? It is a story that reflects genuinely how we believe our own lives should unfold. And so this isn't a new idea. And this was the idea that was playing out at the time of Bruno as well. And so Bruno's idea that, hey, all of these structures are happening and have been happening and this thing is going on and it's still going on and there's new star systems forming and new star systems going away. And, you know, for, for all I can tell, thought Bruno, this has just been the way it's been forever, right? This challenges this idea of a central, progressive, aim-driven narrative cosmology, right? And so it's very dangerous and, you know, one thing that's happening right now in cosmology, which is quite interesting, is that they're, look, they're, they're building bigger and better and, and more precise telescopes. And as they look back into time, right, because, you know, the light takes a long time to travel to us, the hope was, okay, when we have a good enough telescope, we'll be able to see the first moments of the universe, right? We'll be able to see all of this chaotic material forming into the first galaxies. But what's troubling is that they actually just see more perfectly formed galaxies at this state, very close to it. They're not actually able to see back quite 14 billion years, but very close. They're able to see within a couple hundred million years and they see fully formed galaxies, right? Now, there's a lot of people, maybe you've seen some of the headlines who are, who are challenging this Big Bang narrative as a result of that, right? And the dialogue is extremely troubling, and it reminds me very much of this, uh, this instance with this quote that I read you from Bruno, right? Because the, re the response to that is, is very allergic, it's very much like an immune system clamping down on some threat which is perceived to the body of the narrative. And uh, anyways, I'll bring in uh, more of those quotes as we get to it. And... I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm not trying to say that this Big Bang cosmology narrative is wrong, but the challenges that it's experiencing are being treated in a very similar way to the heretical response that the Catholic Church gave Bruno. And that's really something to pay attention to because we have this sense that as we move through the world, as we move through time as a species, that we're becoming more wise and we're, we're not subject to the same sort of irrational dispositions that we were in the past. And I don't think that's necessarily true. And one of the worst things we can do, and we'll talk about this in our story of Orion, is to not pay attention to the things that we should be paying attention to, right? And so let's, let's hold, hold that thought, because when we look at the myth of Orion, we'll see that this is, this is a central crisis in humanity, and it seems to have been that the same central crisis for tens of thousands of years, maybe, maybe much longer, but that's as far as we have a record of it for. Okay, so a really important dichotomy that's going to crop up over and over in this class, I've already spoken about it a bit, is that 
everything, every word that you ever speak relates to one of two things. It's either an idea or it represents a body of some sort, right? Every single word that you speak. And so this textbook, this class, and let's say astrophysics in general is very much concerned with bodies and motion. And it's, ex it's concerned with explaining the phenomena that we observe in the skies in terms of the bodies as they interact with one another. That's what physics is. It's really just the dynamics of bodies and how they interact. Well, there's of course an equally valid perspective which concerns the ideas of what those bodies in motion represent in the world. And we can't lose sight of that. So we're gonna keep touching on that. But in general, as we move through this discussion today, we'll try to separate out those two pictures. And honestly, I think it would be a lot safer if everybody who was working in cosmology was able to integrate those two principles. Because what we've come to is that cosmology traditionally was the, uh, it was in the wheelhouse of the metaphysicians, the church, the philosophers. Cosmology was an attempt to ascribe order to chaos. Now, less than 100 years ago, cosmology turned into something that became in the wheelhouse of the physicists exclusively. And I think this might be where the central crisis emerges because ultimately bodies in motion are not capable of completely capturing reality. And there's a good case to be made that reality is a lot more about the stories that we tell ourselves than it is about where your body is at any given point in time, right? I mean, nobody is really concerned with the, like think about yourselves right now. You're, you're sitting in this room. There's all sorts of interactions between your body and the chair that you're sitting on, but you're not really paying attention to them. You're paying attention, hopefully, some of you more than others, to this, this lecture that's happening right now. And so much of your life is like this. You'll be walking down the road. You're not thinking about the sensation of your feet on the pavement. You're not even really thinking about how to walk. Maybe you're not even thinking about how to write what you're writing down right now. Maybe you're just doing it. What you're doing is processing the story of what's happening, or you're processing the story of what happened last night as you're walking down the street. These stories are actually fundamental to reality. They, I think that they're actually as much real as the physical processes that are playing. And so this, this failure to integrate that into our cosmology and to be able to separate it out is maybe what's led to these terrible conflicts where people are getting burned at the stake or the equivalent thereof in this modern society. So anyways, um, we'll talk about the birth of stars mostly today. Um, we're gonna work towards talking about planets being born, which is an even trickier subject. And uh, eventually we'll get into solar system formation. I, I don't know how far we'll get into that today. Maybe we'll just make it through stars being born. So where does this all happen? Um, and that's the central question that I want to try to answer today. Where do, where do stars come from? So hopefully by the end of today, we'll have a, an answer for that. And there's, there's the physics side of that. And there's also the ideas side of that, the narrative side of that. And hopefully we can answer both of them. All right. So all of this takes place in the equivalent, you know, it's essentially something of a love affair that occurs. Right? Like when a, when a molecule meets another molecule and falls in love is kind of how this happens. And it takes place, say, at a bar. The bar is called a giant molecular cloud. All right? And we've talked a bit about these before. Um, here's a very beautiful one. Uh, this one, let's see. This is an M16 region. So this is about 7,000 light years away from us. This is a Hubble image. And this cloud that you see here is essentially huge columns of cold, cold gas. It's mostly molecular hydrogen and a bunch of dust. Um, and, you know, they shield the radiation from the outside, which allows the interior to grow extremely cold. And I don't think we can overstate how cold it is on the interior of these. We're talking about hundreds of degrees below zero Celsius. We're talking about almost not moving, right? So remember, temperature, heat, is essentially the motion of atoms or molecules, the vibration. Um, 
And these things are almost standing still. They're so cold. And this is absolutely critical in understanding how this happens. Because if I was to just summarize for you how stars form according to astrophysicists, and you'll probably hear this in the popular media all the time, they'll say, well, these giant clouds of gas collapse on themselves. And you might think to yourself, gee, that's kind of weird because, you know, I learned in chemistry that gases fill whatever container they're given, right? If I was to go out into space and pop a balloon full of colored gas, it would just go everywhere, right? And it's true. Uh, but that assumes that those gases have some kinetic energy in the first place, right? That they're moving really fast and they're going to bounce off each other and they're going to go everywhere. These clouds are a bit different of a situation. This is not your typical balloon filled with gas. These clouds are so freaking cold that the atoms are basically not moving at all. And this allows them to interact in interesting ways. It allows them to freeze. It allows them to form complex molecules, which we talked a bit about last week. And it allows the nucleation of little dust, little grains, right? It allows interesting chemistry to take place where dust particles can catalyze molecules to stick together. It allows the interactions, electromagnetic interactions to come together. And so there's a lot more subtlety to this than a ball of gas collapsing and crushing itself into a star. And I hope that will come across. I'm not sure the textbook really captures the, the nuance of that process. And so I'm going to try to illuminate that a bit as we go through. Did you have a question? I'm just asking when the gas It does. Act, well, yeah, that, that's a huge pro part of it is frozen, especially the molecular. So, you know, new, uh, hmm, how do I say this? Gases, elements, let's just say elements, don't like to exist in an unpaired state. So we talked about spin last time. And hopefully uh, if you've taken some high school chemistry or something, you understand that there's this process where atoms have spin pairing, right? One electron and then you, you have a bigger atom and it's got another electron and they, hint, they pair in this interesting way. Elements that have unpaired electrons are very, very unstable and they almost never are found in nature, right? And so as a result of that, uh, atoms form into molecules very easily. They want to electrostatically interact with each other and form molecules. And so once you have molecules, then you can talk about freezing, essentially. Freezing at an elemental sense is not really the, an appropriate term. Um, but I think it's only inappropriate because we never ever would see it. We never ever see atoms existing by themselves, essentially. They're, if you see it, a, a hydrogen, it's almost either always ionized, which means it's electro, yeah, it's, it's electrostatically interacting in this very particular way, which we talked about with other atoms. So you have basically entwined columns of, of simple atoms, right? Forming these giant current conducting uh, filaments, or you have uh, molecules, right? And so molecules are capable of freezing. And that's actually a huge part of it. Remember, a large, a large, large proportion of these clouds, uh, especially the cold ones, are water, right? And so there's a lot of freezing and ice and these dust particles, if you recall from last time, or yeah, I guess it was from last time, time before last, we were talking about uh, these dust particles and they're almost all surrounded in little ice, ice sheets. And so, yeah, this is, this is absolutely essential. There's, this is not just a simple ball of gas collapsing, right? These are very dense uh, regions of condensed matter, okay? Um, okay. So, and they're huge too, by the way. Um, these clouds can range from like a thousand times the mass of the sun to something like three million times the mass of our sun. This is a tremendous amount of material. And... The fact that so much material can exist in one place allows gravity to actually begin to play actually a serious role in the process. And the fact that they're not kicking away from one another too with that kinetic energy that we traditionally associate with gases here on Earth also allows um, for gravity to start to actually play a significant role here. Okay, so the basic picture, um, 
is that these clouds actually turn out to be quite clumpy. Um, and that's actually a technical word. They're called clumps. They're clumps. Um, which is interesting because these dense regions uh, are usually something like 50 to 500 times the mass of the sun. And uh, they're crowded into a, a pretty small region. Now, there's, there's still a really interesting gap in our understanding because the density of these cores of these clumps is still way, way, way less than you would find in a protostar. So the story that we have explains how region, like this story that I'm telling you about molecular formation and cooling, it allows us to get pretty dense cores within these regions, but the density necessary for a star is something like 10 to the 20th times the density of these cores, right? So something else really interesting is taking over and that process is, is right at the very edge of what we know in astrophysics. It's where all of the research is going on. But the annoying thing is that those places, that instant where the star is actually turning from a clump of dense material into something that approximates a star is almost impossible to see. Because what happens is that as these regions nucleate, as these dense cores start to nucleate, they form these disks of dust around them that shield our direct observation of them almost perfectly. And so it also is thought to happen rather very, very quickly. And so that moment where we're transitioning from a dense core into something like a protostar only takes a couple thousand years. So these things are blinking in and out of, out of view faster than we can really get a grip on them. Also very, very tricky to see because they're, they're shielded. So, <clears throat> so that's a bit of an unsatisfying point in this in one hand. On the other hand, I think that it's really exciting because that's a, a place where there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, I think we'll learn a ton about how our own star works by studying this process too. Um, because I think that a lot of the dynamics of that process come down to uh, chemical processes that we can't really directly study on Earth, and also physical uh, electromagnetic processes that we can't really study on Earth because of the <clears throat> sheer magnitude of the currents that we're talking about, the sheer forces and motion, the, the masses of these clumps that are in, pro in, uh, in that are swirling together. And so there's a bit of a story we can tell a bit down the road here about uh, conservation of angular momentum and how spinning bodies organize themselves. And we can, we can play with that a bit. And that's certainly where all of the research is at right now. But the story is somewhat incomplete. And I, I think that's okay. Um, you know, oops. Uh, the chemistry is also extraordinary, extraordinarily complex that's occurring uh, during this collapse procedure. Um, I pulled up this figure, which is a bit inundating, I understand, but I want you to understand that there's, there's really a couple of different processes. In particular, there's, there's some chemistry that occurs uh, with respect to the grains and these nucleations that we warm, and there's other chemist chemical processes that occur uh, in the, as they cool in the cooling regions. Um, you know, in the low temperature regions, there's uh, this process where you have this collapse of a molecular cloud um, and in the first stage, you get the buildup of these ice mantles and these dust strings, uh, which I think is, is what you were asking about earlier. Um, these, these ice grains are mostly simple hydrides like water, uh, ammonia, methane, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, um, some really simple alcohols. And then in the second phase, um, we're talking about the impact of different radiative processes, right? So nearby stars that are already in existence are going to be shooting out their own wind. And these shock waves are going to compress these ice gases and start to unleash a whole series of heated chemist chemical processes that occur. Um, and so this leads to all sorts of ion molecule gas phase chemistry. Um, and 
a whole slew of other reactions where you basically have the ability for these ices to be dismantled in a way that allows them perhaps to transition into the kind of chemistry that we need for a star. Because remember, stars turn out to not be primarily composed of these giant molecules. They're actually composed of highly energized, simple molecules like hydrogen and helium to some extent. And so there is a whole range of astrochemistry. This is a brand new, I don't know, brand new, but it's a mm, accelerating discipline within astrophysics where these processes are being considered more and more in terms of the, the pro, in terms of the production of a star in the first place. Because we need to go from something like gravitational collapse, which makes sense for these cold, chunky molecules, to something where you have these very simple ionized molecules crowded into a space that almost defies the imagination because of the density necessary to actually uh, initiate nuclear fusion. Questions about this? Okay. Now, the rest of our story for today takes place inside of the Orion Nebula. This is the example we're going to use. And so I would like to take a step back and pause and think about this Orion Nebula for just a moment from the perspective of the narratives that we've inherited regarding it. Because I think that they're, I think they tie into what we talked about last week, last lecture. Uh, and I don't think it's a small coincidence that the most visible nebula, this is the Orion Nebula, the most visible stars have always been the most visible stars in terms of the length of time that humans have been staring at them. And so our fixation with this goes back a lot further than these simple, well, they're not so simple, are they? But these uh, material based astrophysical explanations that we're going to be fixated on uh, for the duration of this course. Well, the duration of our, our examination of star formation anyways. So there's a good case to be made that the story, the mythology that is pegged to the Orion constellation is the oldest story that's ever been told. And of course, we talked about how uh, as this is actually a, a bit of a snapshot from that cave painting that we showed, um, which was dated back, I think, to about 15, 17,000 years ago. Uh, although there was an even earlier one, which was from a, a bone carving from 30 something thousand years ago. And, uh, you know, every culture has illustrated this constellation in terms of some sort of a figure, usually a man associated with a hunt. Um, and the most well-articulated version of this, probably, let's say, the most recent version that we have in full form comes from the Greeks, which is where it gets its name, Orion. Um, but it seems like the Greeks inherited this from their uh, predecessor civilization, which was the Minoans. Um, and the Minoans are an absolutely fascinating civilization um, for which we know very little, unfortunately. They inhabited an island in the Mediterranean that was essentially the tip of a volcano. Actually, well, yeah. And very close to that uh, uh, was an actual volcano that erupted. Um, and it essentially devastated the whole region. Uh, and there's, there's some re reason to believe that this led to a widespread civilization collapse uh, of different supply chains, you know, as you can imagine. And uh, there was quite a dark ages, right? It was something like, you know, we think about the dark ages as being the middle ages in Europe. And there was a very similar thing that happened around the time of the collapse of the Minoans. Um, there was a, a vast seafaring nation at the time called the Phoenicians. They also seem to have disappeared around this time. Um, so we lost a lot of the continuity between their stories and the Greeks, but all of the different civilizations that popped up after them seem to have inherited uh, the salient features of that. Um, but it wasn't just in the Mediterranean, it wasn't just in the Western tradition. The Chinese also uh, spoke of Orion as uh, this deity named Shen, 
who was also viewed as a great hunter or warrior. Um, and I don't think this is a, it's hard to believe that this is a coincidence, right? You know, I was talking to my wife about this and, and she is of the impression that, well, this probably makes sense because all of these humans essentially migrated out of Africa at some point and they probably had these stories as they left Africa. That might be true. Um, but I think that it's deeper than that, actually. I think that there's something more fundamental about our own psychology that's playing out in the stories we tell in the sky. And this is what allows us to come up with the same stories at each age, even if there's a dark age and we lose all of the narratives, right? I think even if today, let's say something terrible happens, we get hit by an asteroid or something and human population is decimated and society falls apart. I think that even if we lose all these stories, we'll end up telling the same stories a thousand years from now, because I think there's something absolutely fundamental about this. Um, you know, another case in point is the uh, Aboriginal tribes in Australia have a similar story about Orion. They call it, uh, let's see, what do they call it? Um, they, I can't pronounce this word. I'll try though. Niruna, the hunter. Um, and so it's hard to imagine that the Aboriginal tribes were in any way in contact with the civilizations in the Mediterranean. Uh, let alone cared about their narratives, right? So these things just keep cropping up over and over again. Um, but let's look at the story that the Greeks tell, which let, we can probably to somewhat, with some safety assume, captures uh, the greater overarching story that's being told here about the hunter in the sky. Okay, so the Greek, in the Greek myth, you have uh, this, this gentleman, Orion. And Orion, uh, you know, some of you have probably studied some of the classics, at least. Um, and uh, he's essentially this, this mortal, much like Achilles, if you're familiar with Achilles, who is just absolutely accomplished in what he does, right? He's better than anybody on earth at anything. He's, he brags that he's capable of killing any beast in the forest, no matter how scary, right? He's kind of the ultimate superhero, right? And, uh, well, the story goes that, uh, and, I, and I'm simplifying it greatly, and there's also many versions of this depending on who wrote it down, but the story goes something like this. Apollo, whom represents enlightenment ideas, rationalism, science, art, music, all of the, let's say, the more illuminated angels of our nature, right? Apollo becomes jealous, right? And this is an interesting feature that crops up in all these myths, this concept of jealousy, which I think is a bit blunt. I think it's not quite the right word, but I don't know what else to use. But Apollo starts to resent this hero, Orion. And so he, according to the different uh, myths, uh, plays some sort of trick on Orion, which results in his death. And uh, through, you know, a few different particular renditions of this myth, he actually tricks the spirit of the earth, um, whom is embodied by this uh, deity called Artemis, and in some other versions by Gaia, he tricks this spirit into essentially killing Orion. Okay. Um, and, you know, the way that he does this is variable, but in some version of the myth, this is uh, by placing a scorpion in his path, which actually stings him and kills him. Um, in other versions, uh, an arrow is shot where, into this place where he's hiding uh, in the sea. Uh, this guy can walk on water, by the way, which is interesting, but maybe not relevant to our story. So he's killed, right? Okay, so why is this such a central story for human beings. Why has this persisted for thousands and thousands of years? What's going on here? Um, well, I think that it's actually worth pointing out that I think this story is still going on. So it's not insignificant that at the end of all of this, the gods place Orion in the sky to immortalize him at the end of all this. They, they say, ah, Apollo, I see why you did what you did, but you know, this was a really, really cool human. And so let's give him a place. 
in all eternity, right? Well, I think it's interesting. Um, and actually, my, my wife brought this up to me, too. I got to give her full credit. We still have these kind of people in our society today, right? I mean, why do we call movies, uh, why do we call actors and actresses stars? Isn't that interesting, right? And when we tell stories in our culture today, we don't stare up at the sky and tell stories at night like we used to thousands of years ago. We go to theaters and watch movies with screens, with lights that are flashing around, and there's these people on them that are larger than life that are playing out these narratives, right? And we treat these people as stars. And I think that that's a, I think that that's the same type of character that has existed throughout eternity, at least in, in as far back as humans have been concerned. I think there's always been these individuals and. Uh, there's something else that's going on here, too, because humans seem absolutely fascinated with the stars, right? I mean, like, think about, we, like, the Kardashians or something, right? People love to watch the lives of these people. And you know what else they love to watch? They love to watch it when these people fail, when they go down miserably, right? Why is that? Why do we like to see these people fail? And, and do we like to see them fail or do we like to see them fail when they do something arrogant, right? When they start to believe in their own myth that they're bigger and better than the rest of us, right? There's something really important and real about the way that we, we react to that. It's very important to our civilization that when one of these stars becomes bigger than life and they act as if they're bigger than life in a way that violates our sense of morality, that we cut them down brutally, right? I think this is actually the story that's playing out in the Orion uh, mythology. And uh, I think it's actually playing out not just on the social level, but it's also playing out on the individual level. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to just illustrate this uh, with some interesting examples. So um, just to make the case that I, I'm not just making this up, um, let's think of some examples of this. So. Michael Jackson, I don't know who like the, the stars are in your guys' uh, sphere of influence. I'm just thinking about when I was a kid, right? Some of the biggest people who are just taken down for making some, some act which people perceive as seeming as if this person has arrogantly gone above the so social norms, right? An interesting one in science that played out, and this plays out all the time in science, actually. Uh, I don't know if you guys are aware of this case of Theranos. Do you guys know this story? Anybody? A little bit, yeah. So uh, Elizabeth Holmes was this precocious Stanford undergraduate who had this sort of um, this highly idealized I, I, a vision that what we would be able to do is essentially replace the complex and expensive network of diagnostic tests that you do, right? You go to the doctor, they say, I'm gonna do some blood work. You send it off to the lab. It takes a couple of days. It's just huge mills of machinery and equipment that goes into processing that. All these tests are run, they're very expensive, right? Well, Holmes had this idea that, well, what if we could just take somebody's blood, put it on a little microchip in the pharmacy where you had the blood drawn, let's say, you just have a little, pinprick of blood taken. It's painless. You don't have to, you know, have gobs of your blood taken out of you where you feel woozy afterwards and it's miserable. And we just process it right there. And she was deeply inspired. Um, she very much believed in this, this, this vision, right? Now, that's great. And uh, we, as a society, this would generally make you a star, right? If you could pull this off, if you could rise above some paradigm and improve the situation for all of mankind. This would have been incredible. And she was, in fact, a rising star. Um, she actually managed to raise, I want to say billions of dollars, but I, I, I'm not sure. I think in the order, on the order of billions of dollars, certainly millions and millions of dollars. Remember, this girl was the same age as you guys, right? This is just an undergraduate. She hadn't even achieved, she hadn't even finished her basic chemistry and biology classes, right? 
And so this is where things start to veer into the arrogant side of things, right? This is starting to veer into the Orion, I can kill any creature in the forest that I want to story, right? Well, it turns out that the project that she had imagined for herself was out of reach, actually. In fact, pulling that off is something that people are very much interested in to this day, but it's not so simple, right? It turns out all of those massive machines are, are actually there because we don't have a better way of doing it. It doesn't seem technologically feasible at this point. Well, unfortunately, Holmes didn't come to the ability of being honest about this, right? And I think this is the critical step here, right? The honesty is where things went off the rails, right? And this is where it went off the rails for Orion too. He wasn't entirely honest because he wasn't actually able to kill every creature in the forest if, if he was in, indeed defeated by a tiny little scorpion at the end of the day. And so what did Holmes do? Well, she continued to tell her investors that, yeah, 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 this is all working great. Uh, you know. We're, we're, we're right on schedule with everything. We've got this little box. We can put it in pharmacies and uh, it's going to work out great. And they were like, cool, let's come and see it. So they came in and toured the facility and they wanted to see a little magic black box in action. And uh, Holmes, uh, she embraced her fantasy at that point, right? She didn't say, ah, it's not quite there, but I believe if we can get it there, which I think would have been fine and she would probably have reached well, I don't know if she would have reached her goal, but she certainly would still be working on it as opposed to heading to prison where she's headed right now. So what did she do? She devised a very devious scheme of deceptively taking those test tubes of blood and ferrying them out to a different facility where she processed them the same as everybody else was processing blood samples. And then she returned them to the laboratory and put them in her little black box and said, look, it knows the answers. Now, this happens all of the time, actually, right? And it actually happens in your own life all the time. It happens in my life all the time, and I, I work very hard to fight this off. But there's something that can go really wrong when you stop embracing the most honest representation of what's happening. And the society really, really doesn't like it, and they will absolutely cut you down. And I think that's exactly what's playing out in this Orion myth. Um, and of course, we've seen it. You know, uh, the, the Sam Bankman Freed thing is a very similar situation. Um, I don't know if you're following that. The Bernie Madoff thing when I was a kid was a very similar thing. This, this archetypical social drama plays out over and over and over and over again. And it's played out for tens of thousands of years. And it's one of the most tragic incidences that can happen to a person, right? Somebody who is wildly ambitious, maybe extraordinarily effective at what they do, right? <laughs> It's not every person on earth who can raise billions of dollars as an undergraduate for some scientific endeavor, right? This person obviously had abilities. SBF obviously had abilities. Madoff obviously had abilities. These were talented people, <clears throat> but it's not enough, right? Michael Jackson was a great singer. Find me a better singer than Michael Jackson. Fair enough. He also could play guitar. Um, really good guitar. Uh, so it's not enough though, right? This is the tragic, this is the tragic situation. This is what it means to be a human being, right? This is what separates the human beings from the gods, right? We can aspire to be in the image of the gods. Great. Go for it. But the minute that you start thinking that you are one of them, everything goes wrong, right? The minute you start thinking you're above all of these, you know, mortal procedures, like telling the truth, for instance, it's over for you, okay? And so I want you to think about that when you see Orion in the sky, you know? This is actually, if you, if you don't notice any other constellations, you'll almost certainly see Orion. You can see it every single night. It's very, very visible. And the story that we tell here about the hunter and the defeat of the hunter in pursuit of whatever, in many cultures, it's the pursuit of the Pleiades, which are this cluster of women, actually. And the bull gets in the way and so forth. There's a really, really important reminder here about how to conduct yourself on Earth, particularly if you're one of those extraordinarily talented people, which I hope all of you aspire to be, right? Because life is a long time, and there's a lot you can do in it, actually. Every, each day, even, is a long time, and there's a lot you can do in it. But you have to be careful, too, not to believe in the fantasy. 
Um, and I think that on a very personal level, it's worth reminding yourself that you're not actually who you think you are, right? So think about that for a second. When you think about who you are, when I think about who I am, I think about all of the, all of the best intentions I have, right? right? I, I have a feeling that, for instance, uh, this lecture that I'm giving right now, that I'm going to be able to maximally, with maximum effectiveness, deliver the ideas that I have in my head to you. But in all reality, I'm probably not doing as good of a job as I might in my own mind, right? And so when we walk through the world, we think of ourselves as the collections of all of the best versions of ourselves. But the reality that other people see is actually quite a bit different. If we were to really see ourselves as other people saw us, we would probably think, wow, there's a lot to be improved here, right? And so I think this thing plays out more in our own lives than it does necessarily. Uh, than it, and that's maybe more important than how it plays out among the stars of our culture, right? I think the stars are interesting to us because we can all discuss them and look at them and think about how that's actually playing out in our own lives. And that's why it's so interesting. So, anyways, let's get back to astrophysics. All right. So, here we have the, uh, you can see, you have the, the belt of stars here, and this is the visible light spectrum in the, in the center. Um, off to the, off to your right is uh, what you would see in the infrared. And uh, that's interesting because what you actually see is there's quite a bit of glowing gas all around these things. So you can see that the Orion system is actually quite a bit more than the, than the visible stars that comprise it. And of course, there's, there's uh, quite a few more many stars. This isn't a great picture of it, but there's quite, quite a few more stars than we can see visibly because remember, most of the stars that are out there are, are small. They're much smaller than our sun, actually. Um, and many, many more of those wouldn't even be considered stars. They'd just be considered brown dwarfs, right? Um, and we can go down the scale from that. Now, this, this structure here, this cloud, is enormous. It's something like 100 light years across. Um, the total quantity of gas in that cloud is something like 200,000 times the mass of the sun. So this is enormous. And uh, what's interesting is that the star formation process is somewhat inefficient, at least on our observational time scales and on our theoretical time scales. So only about 1% of the material in these clouds is going to be turned into stars eventually. So it takes a lot to make a little star, right? It takes a lot of material for these forces to combine. So again, this is another really important piece of nuance to the idea that clouds of gas collapse and form stars. It's not quite that simple. The clouds of gas conspire, and, and, and of course, they participate in the formation of a star. But most of that material isn't going to become the star, okay? Um, I'm harping on this only because a, a very common a uh, complaint that I hear about the star formation model is that it makes no sense that a cloud of gas could collapse. And it just isn't that simple, right? The cloud is conspiring to form the star, but it, it is not simply crushing down on itself and making a star. <clears throat> All right. So, you know, as the, as stars form, they're going to generate their own solar winds, which we touched on at the beginning of the course of it. And they're gonna blow away a lot of this dust. So the older stars are the ones we can see because they've cleared out all of that dust around them. And that's, that's something to remember as we think about the age of these stars. Um, and so this is something uh, of the timeline that we can expect here. Um, you know, the oldest stars are shown to the left on this diagram. Um, uh, these, by the way, the scale of these pictures is, is not, they are not to scale, but we fit it all in here. Um, the stars in, in this group disperse, um, and they're not necessarily recognized as a cluster. They move away from each other. There's all this outward pressure from their wind. Um, the younger group of stars is over there to the right next to the molecular cloud. Um, and these are really young. They're only a couple million years old at most. Uh, the pressure of that hot ionized gas surrounding those stars compresses the material. Uh, in the edge of the molecular cloud. And then 
that leads to more density cores that's going to seed more star formation. Um, what else do we want to say about these? You know, not all star formation is necessarily tri triggered by the death of these massive stars, these shock waves. Um, there's all sorts of other things that we're going to get into, uh, including, like I said, the turbulence and the spiral flow uh, of these clouds as they become compressed. And the, there's heat systems that are going on there, too. And I want to really call your attention as we start to think about the nuance of that, the similar processes with storms on Earth, right? Because on the way, how does weather happen on Earth, right? You have cold regions, you have fronts, right? You have cold regions of air and hot regions of air. And they interact and nucleate all of these interesting condensation reactions. And in the worst case scenario, or maybe the best if you're a storm tracker or something, you get extraordinary vortices that form, right? We might call them a typhoon or a hurricane or a tornado, right? When there's extreme disequilibrium between temperatures of these systems, you get interesting structures that form. And I think that's really where we're headed with this moment that leads us from something like a dense cluster into something that approximates the core of a star. Um, and again, that is absolutely at the cutting edge of what is known. And so there's very little to say about it other than hypothetically. All right, so broad scale picture. This is uh, from your textbook, essentially. Um, you know, we can get some, some big pictures from our, our views of these processes occurring in Orion, um, but the details are, are pretty mysterious. So there's definitely a difference in the density uh, of a molecular cloud core and the density of the youngest stars, and, and that's where the mystery is all seated. So one way to think about this, uh, and I think that the hurricane analogy is important, right, because, of course, temperature differentials are going to lead to all sorts of interesting uh, kinetic interactions. But as things become denser as well, um, there's, there's rotation that appears as a result of it. This is kind of the principle that you'll see if you've ever watched uh, like a figure skater, right? They do this uh, kind of amazing pattern where they'll go into a spin, right? And as they, as they go into the spin, like they bring their body in really tight and the spin gets really fast. And then when they come out of it, they stretch their arms out and they slow down, right? And without getting too detailed into the atomics of what makes this possible, we can essentially blame it on inertia. And I'm happy to unpack inertia with you guys later when we get to relativity. But basically what's happening is a conservation of angular momentum, right? As something, uh, as, as the distance of material gets smaller, the speed has to, the total angular momentum, which is material in motion, has to stay the same. And since the material isn't changing, the speed has to increase in order to match the angular momentum. And so there's something interesting that's happening uh, dynamically inside of these tiny little cores that's leading to this rapid spin, okay? Um, and there's something cool that happens there. So if you imagine a spinning uh, nucleus of material, at the polar regions, actually, there's less motion than uh, at the equator. In other words, the things at the equator have to travel more distance in the same amount of time, and so they're actually moving faster. Um, therefore, actually, the gas and dust that's in this region is going to begin to fall inward uh, toward the protostar's equator, and it's going to be held back by that rotation, right? And this is going to lead to the formation of a disk. And this is one of the first features we see in these protostellar systems is this disk appearance. And this is kind of a mixed blessing because, of course, it gives us the means to start to imagine how planetary solar systems form. But it also completely clouds the situation where we have that instant, that moment that maybe only lasts a few thousand years where the thing goes from a clump, a dense core, into a star. So this is a bit tragic as well, because as this principle plays out, we can't really see what's happening. So missing frame of the movie, right? We're missing what happens. Uh, we just, there was a, a bad guy in the room with the gun, and now there's a dead body on the floor, and we don't exactly know what happened. Um, so the next thing we see is that uh, there's accretion, and there's a, there's a pro central protostar that's appeared there. Now, it's not quite at its final mass. It hasn't quite in, in 
uh, included enough material to start fusion. Um, we call this process accretion. Um, and these stars in this particular stage are called T tauri stars. Um, and why it's named that way is, is a bit perplexing. I guess it, it was first found in the constellation Taurus. So there you go. But this is a particular form of star. <clears throat> and um, these T tauri stars are, are not quite stars yet. I don't even know why they're called T tauri stars, but they're, they're almost stars. They're not quite fusing. Um, and so they're like a middle stage between proto stars, almost stars, and the hydrogen fusing stars like our sun. They're actually probably a lot sim more similar to a brown dwarf. And, and in fact, brown dwarfs may be something like these tauri that just give up or they don't have enough material around to keep accreting the material. Um, or they're not subject to enough of the pressures necessary that we've been talking about externally. Maybe the density of the region wasn't enough. Um, and so T tauri stars are, are kind of an interesting piece that picks up, which are not quite a missing link, but they are certainly uh, an interesting piece of the puzzle. So at this point, we start to see stellar wind appearing, which is interesting. If you remember, the stellar wind is essentially ionized hydrogen for the most part. Um, we would say that it's, it's uh, you know, protons and electrons, but I think it's more reasonable to think that it's a, a state of atoms that's somewhat uh, disintegrated in such that those atoms are actually sharing surfaces with one another and there's conduction possible. Um, and of course, the wind is most able, most easily able to escape from the poles because the equators are shrouded in these giant disks that are blocking a lot of this radiation. So the wind is coming out of these. And it's actually this wind, these streams, these jets that we see from the poles that are actually able to lead us back to where these, these star forming regions are happening. Because remember, we can't actually see the stars. They're stuck behind these equatorial disks. And so we get some of these beautiful images of these jets. And there's some of kind of, there's some of the first real sense that we can point to where stars must be located, right? So we're, we're in the indirect evidence phase of this presentation, but this is our best guess because that's how we explain what these jets actually are. And it, it makes sense. Um, so this points us back to the location of where protostars are. And um, we can see some, some very beautiful instances of that. All right. So eventually, the this, this star, as it, as it forms and its wind strengthens, right, as it begins fusing, it's going to blow away a lot of that material. And um, it's going to leave behind something like a thin disk at the, at the center, um, which we can see with visible light. And, you know, the star continues to contract. It's actually, contract, it's actually going through a stage of light, which is similar to Helmholtz's idea of uh, this contractile Yes, this contractile process, which could lead to the formation of a solar system. Um, and actually, we ended up, uh, as we came to understand that fusion was a central driver in stellar evolution, um, we moved away from Helmholtz's idea. But it's interesting to see that Helmholtz came back and is actually making a comeback with respect to the early moments of star formation. Uh, and I think that's really important, actually in science in general, we'll often move away from one idea and then we'll sort of reintegrate it as we move forward. And in particular, I think it's important that as you come up with new ideas in your life and new ways of seeing things, that you find ways to integrate best ideas from the past as you go. So anyways, we can see these disks starting to form. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, so you can actually see these disks in the infrared wavelengths. Um, it's also, you can see it's silhouetted, which is pretty cool. So occasionally also these jets, as they stream out, they'll collide with these somewhat denser clumps of gas that are nearby and they'll excite and ionize the atoms in those gases. And you get this particular, uh, I don't know what you want to say, double half sphere image that appears. Um, and we call this a herbig harrow object. We just call them HH objects. And we see these all over the place in these stellar nurseries, right, inside of Orion. Um, and again, this is another, this is further evidence that this is where these star-forming processes are occurring. 
right? Because we're trying to tell a story of well, where stars come from, but we don't have quite all of the pictures, all of the pieces of that puzzle together. And so this is essentially the hypothesis stage of our theory, right? We have, if in fact, these processes I'm telling you are indeed happening, then they will be sufficient to prove our theory, our explanation of what's happening. But if they turn out to not be the case, then we'll need a new hypothesis. And that's really what a hypothesis is. I think, I think that's worth taking a moment just to lay out for you too, since this is essentially an intro science class. You know, you were probably told in high school that a hypothesis is something like a guess, an educated guess that you'd make, and you test it out, et cetera. But uh, the, the word as it was originally developed, um, it's, a, it's a Cartesian word, um, most, most appropriately uh, wielded by Descartes, is defined as a statement which is not taken as true, but if it was true, it would be sufficient to prove your theory, right? So you can hypothesize something, and then, of course, you have to go out and figure out if that hypothesis is actually tenable, if it's consistent with all of your observations, if it's consistent with itself, is it self-contradictory and so forth. So much of these ideas that I'm putting on the table to you are hypothetical in that we can't directly observe them, but we can see other things which point us back to it. And so if this process that I'm telling you about star formation is, is the case, then these explanations will hold. Okay, so there's some uh, pretty cool HH objects here on the screen. This, um, in this bottom one uh, in particular, you see this double beam jet, which is kicking out of a protostar. And the, and the protostar is hidden. It's actually inside of a, a big dusty disk. And uh, tip to tip, this is almost a light year long. Right, and uh, you can see the bright, the bright regions on either side, and this is where the jet is slamming into these clumps of interstellar gas and causing it to glow. This is not a totally dissimilar process than what's happening in these um, lamps above our heads right now, uh, minus the the fluorescent processes, um, which give it the visible glow. But of course, if you could see ultraviolet, um, you wouldn't need the, the fluorescence to be able to see these lamps. Okay. Um, so the next step in this story concerns how do planets get formed? And instead of launching into that story today, I think that we should save that for our next lecture. But I do want to conclude this presentation uh, by checking off whether we've answered the question that we really set out to answer in the first place, which is how do stars form? And there's two answers to that question, right? There's an astrophysical explanation and there's a metaphysical explanation, right? Astrophysically, we have a cycle of renewal of material in interstellar space. Our star is constantly taking off atoms into interstellar space at high speed, extraordinarily high speeds. And we call these, uh, we call these, uh, we call these wind. We also, when in a, in a big enough star system, like in an exploding supernova, we might call these cosmic rays, but there's a great deal of material being projected. And that material is getting recycled, right? It's going out into interstellar space. It's, it's sitting out there, it's undergoing all sorts of interesting photo reactions, it's getting ionized, it's cooling off as it's dense enough, it's shielding itself at the inner interior, it's being shielded from radiation, it's being shielded from being warmed from shock waves. There's all sorts of really interesting cooling processes, chemistry, molecules forming, dust grains, catalyzation of reactions, the production of molecular water and ammonia and complex molecules, right? There's, there's an increased stillness in those regions. It's very quiet. The atoms are almost not moving at all. The molecules are almost not moving. And this density grows and the interactions grow. And the, the, the weather systems within those clouds start to play on the dynamics, the motion, the swirling of those molecules, right? 
you get interesting vorticular motion, these vortexes, much like a hurricane that are starting to happen deep inside of these, these little seeds at the cores of these systems start to play out. And we didn't even talk about ele electromagnetism in this process, but it's undoubtedly an important player too, because what holds back the surface of the sun from just evaporating into wind, all of it? Well, there's all sorts of interesting magnetic structures that appear, right? And these are, if you look at the surface of the sun, you see all these beautiful sunspots with these really intricate filamentary structures that occasionally rupture and give off flares, right? So we can expect that there's also similar processes happening during the star formation process that are stitching it together. And of course, then you have this spinning, right? You have the, the concentration of material into denser and denser regions and, a, and the accretion of material. And eventually there's too much stuff in one place and the atoms start to join together, which actually relaxes the whole network and you get this outward force of fusion, which pushes back against gravity, let's say. And so there's this beautiful balance in a fully formed star like our own, where you have an equilibrium between the pressures that would be pushing it apart, let's say the thermal results of fusion and the radiation pressures of fusion and the gravitational collapse of all of this material. And it just stays there in perfect hydrostatic equilibrium. There's a surface that appears, right? There's a constraint. The star has a spherical shape to it. And so that's the astrophysical story of where stars come from. I think we've, we've more or less answered that to the best of our ability right now. There's also the question met metaphysically of where stars come from. And I think the answer is something like, well, people can do extraordinary things in their lives. Some people can, can glow much brighter than others, right? But that doesn't make them infallible either. And that doesn't mean that they're above the same processes that would take down a normal average human as well. And there's something really, really, really important playing out in that narrative that we see in the stars of our own lives and in the stars that we see on the movies and the music and everywhere else. We pay attention to these people for very good reason, for the same reason that our ancestors paid attention to their gods in the sky. It's because they play out the same dramas that we play out in our lives every day. And those stories are every bit as real as the molecules that conspire to create stars in the astrophysical sense. They're perhaps even more important because, generally speaking, when you leave this classroom today, you're probably not going to be considering the molecular activities that are, your body is undergoing as you make your way through your midterms or whatever's going on in your life right now. The stories of how you conduct yourself are actually far more important to the reality that you experience. So anyways, that's how stars are formed. Next time, we're going to talk about how planets are formed. And then we'll eventually talk about how all of these things end and how the cycle starts over. Have a great start to your week, guys.